In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Gospel lesson today brings up the issue of loving one another and loving God <clears throat> the way the commandments tell us to do. But it also brings to us the picture of who we are and how we love, or rather how handicapped we are when it comes to loving. And I, as your priest, am the first one to confess that I don't know how to love you very well. In our relationships at home, private and so on, we think that we love and we are fulfilled by love. And we grade ourselves telling we're good people who know how to love. Maybe even pet ourselves saying, wow, we're doing such a great job loving others. The lesson today tells us that we should be careful in the way we we pray and we act when it comes to loving God and loving one another. The lawyer is not one that goes to court to fight with others, but is one who knew the law very well. And this man, the know so knowledgeable, comes to Jesus Christ attacking him, wanting to shame him and put him on the spot. But the Lord answers him in a way that was way higher than what he thought turning the whole situation on its head and teaching him and us a great lesson about who we are and who God is and what we ought to do in order to be with God. The parable, this is a parable, is told by the Lord Himself. It's not something real, it is a parable that talks about a man and this is us, somebody, a man, all of us, all of us. The man was going down from Jerusalem, down to Jericho, from the holy place to the place of sin, when he was beaten up by the robbers. This is the image of humanity, of all of us, going down from, from the Garden of Eden to where we have to, what the world we know today beaten by the devil. The robbers are the devils who come to take away the image of God entrusted to us, to distort that through sin, to bring death. But you see, the devil here, the robber, did not kill this man, us. The devil didn't, doesn't kill us. He cannot. Even though the body will be abused in whatever ways, the soul is immortal. Would this be immortal life or immortal condemnation? But the soul is immortal. So the robbers did not kill the man, but stripped him and beat him and left him half dead. And it's important at this point for us to, for, in order to move forward with this, to realize that this is us. And if I don't recognize myself as being half dead, nothing else matters in here. If I'm good, if I'm alive, none of Logimeno will be one, the saved one. So we start with the premise here with a prayer that we, we recognize, we, we look deep inside and see that half dead part to continue in this miraculous, miraculous event. So what happened? This man was us, beaten up, and there are two people to walk in who have degrees. You see, you're, they're wearing the uniforms and the vestments. The first one, by chance, we're told, accidentally he walked by a priest, somebody who served in the temple, somebody who knew very well that coming close to a dead body would defile him. And he was, he was not going to be able to serve in the temple. Yes, he didn't have mercy. That's true. But this man put the ritual above mercy. I mean, look at me here. I'm the one leading us in the ritual. And what an easy temptation this is. The ritual above temptation and mercy above, above mercy. So this was the priest. Kept going, passed on the other side. The other one was a Levite. He too was a servant at the, pre, at the temple, like a deacon more or less. What did he do? He came to the place saw him, 
and uh, passed, I'm sorry, and passed on the other side as well. Why? Well, he must have thought, this is a decoy. This is a guy like other robbers on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, pretending they are dead. And when I go close to him, he's going to jump up and kill me and, and take my money. This man didn't want to take the risk. Didn't want to take the risk to step up. He feared. He feared something. Now your ears are used to the word fear because we've been talking about fear lately here. In the world we know now, cornering us from all directions to have fear. If it's not the COVID, it's the elections. If it's not the elections, it's the counting. If it's not the counting, it's the uprising. If it's not the radical right, it's the radical left and so on. Fear. The enemy is the one who instills fear. God is the one who instills peace and confidence. So this man here, fearful, decided to move on. Didn't want to go touch. No mercy, but fear was above mercy. And finally, we hear that the third one, the Samaritan. We know that Samaritans and Jews didn't get together because the Samaritans were a polluted race in there that were mixed because of the migration and the Babylonians and everything else, that whole history. And the, 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 the Jews would not even step foot in Samaria. Okay? So here's one rejected by the Jews, including by the one who was beaten up. It was probably obvious for him to tell that they were not of the same tribe and they were not quite on the same page. But the Samaritan journeyed. This man was not there by random coincidence. But there's a purpose. The Samaritan, God, has a purpose in mind. To come to the one who's beaten up. Who's that? Right here. Gathered up. So there's a plan. There's a journey. There's a GPS. There's a, there's a pointer that God follows in this journey. And he came to where he was. And when he saw him, like the other ones, unlike the other ones, he had compassion. He had compassion. And we too, at times when we see somebody in trouble, our heart jumps and we react out of mercy and, and, and we, we go and do good things. We might give some money. We might give something. You know, we have this reaction that you see the Samaritan has planted in us at our creation when he made us. So he had compassion. Now, this is where we begin to know who God is. Until now, we looked and saw who we are. The beaten one laying down and the other ones who minded their own business out of self-love. But now, with God present, we see new things. He comes to the, to, the, um, to the victim there, bounds up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. The wounds, bleeding, sin coming through, our lives, hurting one another, hurting ourselves, hurting God, just the deep bleeding. Now the Good Samaritan comes, God comes, to heal this with two ingredients. The oil that is soothing, that is God's love, God's embracing. When we're in trouble, when we're in need, when we're desperate, when we're down, when we're depressed. But he also brings the wine, the medicine that's Hurts when applied in order to remove the infection. His word, the word of the gospel, the truth that put against our lives. It's like acidic. It hurts. Look at this. Who's up on the cross now in the sun? And look at me. Who, who, am, I, who am I? Look the way he loves me and the way I love. And it takes a little bit of pain to change that. That is the wine. Some other fathers talk about oil and wine as the two natures of Christ. Perfect God and perfect man. But nevertheless, God, the Samaritan, takes him on his own beast. Reminding us of the Son, Jesus Christ, who put our humanity, broken nature, the way we have it, our nature upon his shoulders. God 
took humanity upon him at his incarnation. This is the, uh, the beast that carried us, the beaten man, and took him to an inn. The inn here to take care of him. We know that we are now in the inn. The inn represents the church. The Samaritan, that is Christ now, stayed at the inn for three years. And he instructed the apostles, the disciples, what to do to carry on the business of the inn, that is the well-being of the church. Once he departs with his ascension, the inn is supposed to continue to do what? The healing and the, uh, the restoration of the beaten one. He left two denarii, representing the Old Testament and the New Testament, and he said to the innkeeper, to those who lead the church, take care of him, and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come. If you spend more than what I entrust to you, at my second coming, at the time of judgment, you will receive it. You will receive it. So, here we are today, here we are today, in the church, continuing the healing work that the Lord Himself started for humanity. Now, you know we have a prayer in the, in the service. We'll come up in just a little while here. You brought us out of nothing into being. And when we, fallen away, when we had fallen away, you raised us up again. You left nothing undone until you had led us up to heaven and granted us your kingdom, which is to come. You left nothing undone. Our natural, easy way to express compassion, to express mercy, is through the feelings. Yeah, I see these people in Ethiopia struggling. You know, they are being killed there. They have a war with the Eritreans, you know. Yeah, but I'm good here. I see the poor one. I see the one who doesn't have a home. I see the one who is away from Christ. I see the one who is an addict. I see the one who makes a god of himself, the way he dresses, the way he works. And we have kind of compassion for this. And we might help them with the money here, with this here. But the Lord today teaches us that that kind of love is not sufficient. You see, he changes the mind of the lawyer who asked him kind of aggressively, who is my neighbor? In other words, I'm in the center, like the axle of a wheel. I'm in the center. And from those around me, really, teacher, whom do you want me to love? Who is my neighbor? Is it Nadia? Is it Jacob? Whom should I go love? And by the end of the parable here, the Lord asks him, who do you think proved neighbor to the man? He tells him, it's not about you to be in the center. The one beaten up is the, the one that, that you have to care, to have to who is in the center. And those on the periphery are the ones who are called to be his neighbor. He is the one in the center. Not me. Not me. When I'm in the center, I'm well. When the beaten one is in the center and I'm called to be his neighbor, I am like him. I recognize that I am with him as beaten up as he is. And with humility, I approach him. And how am I to approach him? The Lord says, have mercy on him. How? Go and do likewise. And what did the Lord do? Did the Lord stop by and say, hey, take 10 bucks, go to the pharmacy and fix up yourself? He didn't do this. He did everything possible to the end to restore this person. What did he do? 
He went by. He touched him. The other ones would not. He gave what he brought to heal him. Took him to the church. Stayed with him there. Made sure that he was going to be taken care of by those who are still left in the church. And stay there until his second coming. Now, do we love this way? When we see the need for love, do we accidentally give and move on? Many times not even knowing what that giving does or who this person benefiting from this is. The calling for mercy today, brothers and sisters, as we begin the Advent, the fasting 40 days before Christmas, is to love more than through feelings, but through service. This is what the Lord teaches us. And if you feel like you don't serve, that's good. It means that you feel that beaten up, that you're beaten up. I feel this really badly, really badly. Our handicap today is that we don't go all the way. And why is that? Because we love the wrong person ourselves and we put ourselves in our center and ask oh, who, who is my neighbor no the question is whose neighbor am i and whose neighbor should i be the neighbor of every single one all right what do we do here you see the lord turn the whole thing paradigm on his head by placing the beaten one in the center it's about him it's not about me helping. It's not about my feelings. It's about him. Yesterday and Friday, they were so blessed, the parish council members and the few people from here, to attend a seminar. A seminar conducted by experts in the field of uh, leadership, faithful people serving in the altar, a couple of them, priests and deacons, who brought to us a deeper understanding of how we are to love. And practical means what we ought to do. Realizing that simply giving, putting the dollar in the basket when the collect comes, actually hopefully we're not going to do this anymore, or signing the check for the organization is not the calling of the gospel. Although it's a good entry point to show mercy and practice it, by all means we should do that, it's not going to cut it for us the long, the long way for the journey. So we looked yesterday this very issue here of, of helping the one who's beaten up. And to my surprise, there were some attending saying they were surprised hearing that the beaten up is not just the poor man who doesn't have a house. That the beaten one can live in a palace and drive the Bentleys and have no peace. Have suicidal thoughts. Huh, how about that? And live in sin day and night in darkness. So the beaten up, we have lots of them here present and many more not present. Don't only think of the poor out there begging at the, at the train station. But the approach of engaging with love can come in two ways. Both ways appear to be good as being servants, servants serving. The first one here is the imprint of the secular world in our mind, on our mind. And it goes like this. It starts with me. It starts with my will, driven by feelings. If I see the guy in trouble, I feel it. And it is my will, Lord, from the center position, to grant him a 0.001% of my treasure. It is my will. And this grows in something that we label love. Ah. It's directed at self. Self-gratification, right? A sacrifice, a service of sacrifice that points to us. Assessed by us, ourselves, how we're doing. Personally, and as organizations. Haven't we done great this summer with whatever? Look how much we have delivered. It keeps us in the center 
And it brings to one involved with this a status, a badge, and authority. And authority. And the one who speaks to you right now might have fallen prey to this model in his ministry. That's me. But now you know better. And if you see me doing this, say, Father, this is false humility. This is false authority. It is not right. And then I'll ask you, what is right? And you should tell me this. Remind me the following. The servant model that we called yesterday doulos in the Greek language means slave. Slave model. Model today by the Lord himself, the good Samaritan. That doesn't begin with me. Just like he turned the whole situation with a, with a, with a law, lawyer there. You are not to be in the center. The victim is in the center. The Lord now tells us when it comes to loving, you are not to be in the center. But what's in the center, Lord? God has to be in the center. The word, the gospel, the living word of God has to be in the center. And from this, the way we relate to one another, we love and serve comes up. And how different this is from the secular model, which is what? Me in the center, oh, my feeling, and the way I sacrifice, and my, at times, involuntary placing up on the place of the, on the rank of authority. Here's how it goes. It takes the knowledge of the Bible, understanding of the commandments, understanding of the Word of God, and relationship with that Word of God. And if we don't have this, don't you think, you should, we shouldn't think that we can go on this path. Automatically we're disqualified to the other one, to the secular model. We ought to have a living relationship with the living Word of God. The Scriptures, the Bible, funda foundation of the, of the whole thing. We ought to be doing the work of the body of Christ. Be meaning what? This is the body of Christ right here, belonging to this. This is the word that's preached. This is who, who, who transferred the word of God to us 2,000 years later. We have to be watchful of how we behave and guard one another. This special to the good servant is the realization that we are all, now that we understand the gospel, we are under authority. Meaning what? Lord, I don't do what I want. I am your servant, or Zulus. I'm under your authority. You see the difference here? I'm not in the center. You're in the center. Not only that, but I bow my knee to you. And whatever you say, I do. And the authority entrusted to us here in the body, through your bishops, through your priests, I take that. I seek the blessing, I follow the guidance, I don't deviate. I even come to the inn for the mysteries, you know. It's what the inn provides. Confession, communion. I'm under authority. Finally, out of this stems out the love. Out of being under authority, out of putting God the word, the center in the, uh, the, the word in the center, comes out the love for caring for the least of these. Remember the least of these? How it could be in all situations, the least of these. What is this kind of love? Brothers and sisters, it's not a feeling. If you give out of feelings, put that aside. It's a calling. It's a duty. It's a command. Go and do the same. Loving one another. This is the model. And you see now how we fail? How I fail. Loving, caring for the least of these. And how is this to be manifest? Listen to this. Your station in the church body. Your station. Your role. Your ministry. Your serving. Your serving. Not the feelings. The serving. How? As the Good Samaritan did. From the beginning till the end. This is true love. This is true love. 
And I would say here, not only to bind the, the wounds, but also to bring to the inn. Let us keep, in this, give, keep this in mind. When we help others outside, with money in particular, or gifts, how we betray them if we don't bring Christ to them. We just give them the diluted love. The true love is the one that brings them to the inn. To be perpetually there. We are those in the inn. So, out of the scriptures, in the body of Christ, out of duty and authority, we love because God loved us. And in the church body, how do we do this? Offering from the first fruits. Whew, what a surprise. Offering for the, from the first fruits. We love one another. We love the neighbor because we're all in that situation. In the, okay. What do we offer from the first fruits? Well, I'm sure your mind jumped up at the tithing. The paycheck comes in, apply the 10% and bring it to the altar. And from the, this 10% now, we as a church, as the body of Christ, whatever percentage we can grow towards 10, we make an increased effort to make sure that we all go out serving to help the needy. The first fruits of your time, of our time, this morning, the first fruit of your time, whose psalm was given out of love, under obedience, because the commandments of the word were in your mind and your heart. That's why the best time of the weekend, Sunday morning, you're here early in the, in the church. What did you do? You served. Christ served. He said, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve. Why do you come to church? To be served? Well, let's fit in this model here. We come to serve. Yes. The divine liturgy, the work of the people is service. And we give out of the first fruit. What? Time, energy in the divine liturgy on Sunday. And if you say, I don't have time, Father, it means that there's something else that takes the first fruit of that time. Whether this be work, whether this be television, football, or whatever. So, in truth, what else do we give from the first fruits? The way we prepare from the best we have. We prepare for what? For confession, for the divine liturgy, for receiving communion, for our meetings, parish council, philoptokos, altar boys, chanting, serving in the narthex, serving in the altar. The preparation, give from the first fruits, the best of me. So we ought to look at this now. Do we see ourselves in this? I see this in many of you. Thank God. I have a hard time seeing it in me most of the time. But we struggle between the two models here. Because we love ourselves so much, we suffer of this pride. And we like to be up there. Put the feeling. No, we don't put the feeling in the center. We put the word in the center and the commandment to, that grows through through this whole rank here again in the body of Christ as a duty under authority to love, to care for the least of these by offering the first fruits. It's how we love one another. Just look around. Judge, judge. Think of how we offer our first fruits. Do I really love you, my neighbors? Ouch. This is the parable today who we are, and what the Lord God did for us, serving. You see, he went all the way to the end. Our vision is to be the inn. Our vision, community of St. John, we ought to be the inn. What does it say, Mary? I will not put you on the spot. Or Jacob. Our Orthodox community seeks transformation in Jesus Christ. To become the inn, and to, to be healed in the end. By, by stating this, we say that we are the sick ones. And if you don't seek this, if you don't feel like you need to be transformed, our community seeks transformation in Jesus Christ and to bring people to Christ. What does it mean to bring people to Christ? To do what the Good Samaritan did. 
from the beginning till the end. This is what mercy does in service. And what happens in the end? We worship. It's part of the duty there under authority. We teach and we learn ourselves. We try to live the gospel, including the lesson today, and try to be a community in the inn, not outside, because outside you have the Levite and the priest and the, the, the robbers. This community. And finally, the epistle reading today tells us why. Why is this? God, who is so rich in mercy, out of the great love with which He loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses. You see us here? The man from the parable? Even then, made us alive together with Christ. What does it mean? Great gift. It's worth gratitude. Gratitude. And raised us up with Him, with Christ. And made us sit with Him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We are in the authority. We listen to the word. Because we are called to follow this path in Christ. In the Good Samaritan. And St. Paul teaches something that the Western churches like to chop. But today our reading is in its entirety. For grace you have been saved through faith. The grace of God is the gift. And we embrace this through faith. But it doesn't stop here. And it is, he's mentioning, making it very, very clear here. Not because of our works we receive this grace. We haven't done anything good. No. It's a gift, the grace. But, created where his, his workmanship created by Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before him that we should walk in them. Through faith, receiving God's grace for good works, which is what? Serving. Serving, going all the way. Going all the way. Serving. Up in the narthex, up the computer, up the chanting, whatever that is. Top of the list, the liturgy. So, faith shown through works. But St. James says, you have faith, show me your works. You do works out of what? Out of faith. The two of them together. Walking in them. May the good Lord, good Lord be with us today to open our hearts as the prayer said. That we understand these words and do them. What is it to do? Prepare for Christmas. Nativity is 40 days away. A season when we should reflect. Parents and grandparents and children as well. How do we show mercy to one another? Are we truly merciful? Are we loving one another? And who's telling us, who's telling me how to love? The answer is Christ, the Good Samaritan who out of love and great mercy for us, continues to love us although we're down in the pit, and continuously brings us by our hand to the end here, to the end. And the way we respond to this is His way. We remove us from the sin, we place the other whom we serve, and in order to do this, we press Him at the center of our life and obey Him, becoming under authority. So may this be a transformed season for us, May the good Lord, through all the challenges that he gives us, continue, continue to come pour upon us. Give us the chance to repent and learn how to love the way he loves us. Amen.